Hello, everybody. So we're going to be talking about your blood vessels. This is this should all be short and sweet. This normally takes me, when we are doing face-to-face -face classes, a single night of lecture to go through all of this stuff. I'm going to break it up into two, maybe three videos if things get too long. Um, so we are going to talk about the blood vessels. In your first video here, we're straight up going to be talking about the definitions and terms you need to know, and the differences between your three types of blood vessels. Um, pretty straightforward. That means we are going to be going over objectives 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 11. Right? So, blood vessels. We know that it is their job to carry blood around your body, either away from the heart, to the tissues to feed the nutrients in your blood and oxygen from red blood cells to individual cells, or get the blood back to your heart so your heart can then pump it through your pulmonary circuit to your lungs and then back around your body again, right? That is the entire job of your blood vessels that we are trying to understand and facilitate. Uh, so you have, this is an image of the blood vessels around your lungs. Notice how you have, like, the white tubes there are the ones that are carrying air. And you can see how you have small capillaries and blood vessels going between all of those um, bronchioles. You will get there when we get hit your respiratory system into these lovely little... Um, so that you have diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide from lungs to blood and back again. You have blood vessels surrounding your heart to feed your heart, and your heart is what pumps all of this. And then you have this lovely diagram of all the nuanced details going through your body. You can see there's also a bunch of blood vessels around your intestines, liver, stomach, that kind of good stuff. Right? So the first things we are going to talk about, right? Um... Um, some very basic definitions. You have structure and function of everything. Vessels that are carrying blood away from the heart are called arteries. Any vessel that is carrying blood toward the heart is called a vein. Because of this, oxygenated blood is colored in red deoxygenated blood is colored in blue, right? Generally speaking, these small blood vessels where gas exchange and nutrient exchange is happening with your cells are colored purple because these nets of capillaries, capillaries are the smallest blood vessels um, that exchange nutrients directly with cells from your blood supply. Um, because that is sort of where the blood is becoming deoxygenated and being used, essentially, happens. They are depicted as purple in your fancier graphs like this. We are going to be mostly talking about your systemic circuit, which is your heart getting oxygenated blood to the rest of your body, and then back to your heart again. But you also have a pulmonary circuit, which is getting the blood from the heart to the lungs to exchange carbon dioxide for oxygen, and then getting back to the heart again. Right, so you have this lovely back and forth here. Uh, for the most part, arteries are going to be red for the systemic circuit, um, and veins will be blue for the systemic circuit. Those two aspects switch for the pulmonary circuit, because remember... The, the pulmonary circuit exists to oxygenate the deoxygenated blood, right? So we need to understand the different layers of your arteries, right? So you have different layers within your arteries and veins, right? We have to discuss the different layers. So objective one is compare and contrast the structures and functions of the vessel wall layers. You have three major layers of your blood vessels. The inner layer is called the tunica intima. Layers in Latin are called tunicas. So, like we now we know that, we're going to have to just talk about the tunicas. Tunica intima is the most 
internal one. It is closest to blood. That means it is intimate with blood in your insides. That's why it is the tunica intima. They have a small muscle layer, right? So they have small muscle layers. That muscle layer there is called the tunica media because it is the middle layer, and middle and muscle both start with the letter M to help you remember that. And then you have the outer layer called the tunica externa. Another name for your tunica externa is also the tunica adventitia, right? Depends upon which textbook or lab manual you're looking in. Um, this is going to protect and anchor the blood vessel to the surrounding structures. This way your blood vessels don't just like fly willy-nilly as though they were strings floating around in your body. Your tunica adventitia is going to anchor it to the place it's supposed to be inside you. Um, the job of your tunica interna is to reduce friction. You don't want sticky blood because you know your blood has sugar in it and all of you have gotten a cut before and felt how sticky blood is. None, like, nobody wants the blood that's inside you sticking to your insides, right? It's not maple syrup. Um, so your tunica intima, the job of it is to keep blood flowing and not stuck to your insides. The tunica media is smooth muscle. That means you don't think about controlling it with your mind, right? It's smooth muscles. And those smooth muscles are going to control vasoconstriction and vasodilation. That means these smooth muscles that are lining your arteries and veins are going to control how, like, when your veins and arteries widen, like when you're exercising and you need more blood flow, your, like, these muscles will make your arteries get wider. Or when you're asleep and you need to relax and your heart rate slows down, they will kind of, die, like, they will constrict and make things get more narrow. Right? Um... So those are the three jobs of this. This is likely the model you guys saw in your lab class. You can see the lumen where the blood is touching the inner lining here. Um, this is all tunica intima. Your easiest way to understand this, you can see this tunica media here. You see where the muscle layer is on both of them. Everything inside the muscle layer is tunica intima. Everything outside the muscle layer, tunica externa or tunica adventitia. Um, another thing I would like to point out for your differences between veins and arteries before we get more specific, arteries have a, have more muscle. So they have a thicker tunica media than veins do. And veins, to prevent backflow, because your arteries kind of, uh, let gravity do some of the work, your veins to prevent backflow and to ensure that blood gets back to your heart have valves in them. So veins have valves, arteries have a, thickle, a thicker muscle layer. That means if we're going to look at this one, this is a thin muscle layer, even though you can't see any valves. Thin muscle, this is also a vein, right? Um, this is also missing this additional elastic layer that is on arteries, that is not on veins. This is labeled incorrectly. This one is a vein. Um, yeah. One other thing I would like to point out, and this is sort of brain breaking, right? Even your arteries and veins need to feed off of the blood that is flowing through them. Like these, the cells that make up your arteries and veins also need oxygen and they also need nutrients such as sugar that's found in your blood. So you have itty bitty little capillaries that break off from the inside of these arteries and veins and go around the outside of them to feed these inner muscles. So on this cut diagram, you see all these little dots of cross cut mini capillaries, and you can see one along the outside of this artery here. Those collectively are called the vasa vasorum, right? They are considered part of the tunica externa, and they are a small, tiny network of arteries and capillaries that are going to supply the large tunica externa with the blood it needs to keep your other arteries and veins going. Right? This is, this is just like everything else. Things get more and more specific the deeper you look and the more inside you go. And things can always get bigger and bigger and bigger the more outside you start looking at things. Just like with all science. Um... 
But yeah, right? Right. So, before we start talking about specifics of linings and whatnot, we need to talk about vasoconstriction and vasodilation, right? Because objective number two is define and describe vasoconstriction and vasodilation, right? Dilation, like when you go to the doc your eye doctor and they make your pupils really big, they dilated your eyes. Vasodilation means your, like, vessels were dilated. They got really wide. So vasodilation means your arteries and veins got wider. Vasoconstriction is the opposite. Constriction means it gets tighter, like a boa constrictor hugs its prey to death. So vasoconstriction means everything is going to contract and get more narrow. At least the tubes, like, your vessels going through your body are. All of this is controlled by that lovely tunica media and these muscles on the inside. And they take signals from a number of different... It's smooth muscle, so you don't actively think about controlling it. And a lot of it is held in place by connective tissue. Um, but they take their signals for what needs to happen from a number of sources. Um, various hormones in you, such as epinephrine, epinephrine, fight or flight response, is going to get your heart rate up and it wants to pump more blood so you can either fight or fall or like run, right? So that's going to cause vasodilation to get more blood more places, um, as well as up your heart rate. That's what epinephrine does. Other factors will cause vasodilation, so it will, like, if you are older and you've lost some of the elastic in your arteries and veins and they cannot dilate as much, they may start to constrict as you get atherosclerosis. Certain things will make your blood vessels constrict and get thinner. Other things dilate. They take a number of hints and signals based upon blood pressure, hormones, medications you're on, emotions. They they detect a number of things and try to open and close for a best case scenario. Right? Um Right? And if we're going to look at these pictures under a microscope here, you can see an artery has thicker walls and it's wider. And the veins are kind of more floppy and squished. It's what happens. Right? This leads up to number three. Right? Objective number three is relate the structure and function of the three types of arteries. You have three different types of arteries. You have elastic arteries, which are also called conducting arteries. Muscular and distributing arteries. Right? And arterioles. If something ends in eel, it's sort of, it's like the Latin way of saying it's tiny, right? It's sort of like in Spanish when you add the word ito or the suffix or ito on the end of it, it means little. So eol means little in Latin. So arterioles are smaller arteries, right? So the first one we're going to talk about are your elastic or conducting arteries. Um, their job is to be a blood pressure reservoir, right? So their job is to be a pressure reservoir. They have low compliance. Their job is to basically eat to the, bl eat to the brunt of blood pressure that has been created from your heart actually beating, right? So if you, we remember, your heart pumps rather strong, and that blood is pumped directly like when you give a ketchup bottle a hard squeeze, directly into the aorta. The aorta is a strong example of an elastic artery because that aorta is taking the brunt of the blood pressure and force that is pumped out of your heart, right? It has to eat that blood pressure or eat that pressure from the heart contracting before that blood can pump elsewhere because if your aorta was not elastic, if your aorta was stiff and it couldn't eat that quick sudden burst of pressure from your heart actually beating, it would burst if it was stiff, right? That's bad, 
right? That would be very bad. You would internally bleed out. No good would come from that. So other examples of elastic arteries would be your aorta, pulmonary trunk, and your subclavian arteries because they are their hookups are so close to the aorta, right? Because remember, this is your subclavian, and then you have this is a brachycephalic trunk in the subclavian right off of that. They are built to soak some of these some of that pressure from your heartbeat, right? The next type of arteries are your muscular arteries. They're also called distributing arteries. The entire job of these distributing arteries is to deliver blood to specific organs and get it to other parts of the body. That means they have a large ratio of tunica media to the rest of it, and they are good at vasoconstriction because they're going to try to help mitigate and control your blood pressure. So some good examples of these lovely muscular arteries whose job it is to get the blood from the main artery like your aorta to other parts of your body into organs. You have your renal artery, which is taking blood from the abdominal aorta or the celiac trunk to the kidney, right? And then you have other things like your brachial artery, which branched off of the axillary artery, which branched off of the subclavian. So your brachial artery is the main artery in your upper forearm, and its job is to get blood down your arm to the rest of your arm, right? The third type of artery are the tiny arteries, the arterioles, right? These are called resistance vessels, right? Um, these are the smallest arteries that you have, but they are also one of the strongest um, players in your blood pressure regulation. They regulate your blood flow because their goal is to not have blood pressure be too high to burst the capillaries as the capillaries are what's allowing your blood to trade cell waste like carbon dioxide for the oxygen that the red blood cells are carrying, right? That means the capillaries are the tiniest of blood vessels. They're very, very fragile, right? So the arterioles control your blood pressure very specifically to ensure that blood coming from them does not burst a capillary, right? Which is why these are called resistance vessels. They're the smallest of your arteries, but they're going to regulate your blood flow the most. Um, so these guys have vascular tones. They, they sense your blood pressure as it's flowing through, and they're going to constrict or dilate and help regulate things based upon your body's needs. Right? Um, and that's that's what you that's what y'all gotta know about capillaries. Or I'm sorry, that's what you gotta know about arteries. Capillaries are the next blood vessels we are going to talk about. And like I said, these are the smallest ones. But once again, you have three type of capillaries, right? Um, and they all have different jobs. Each different type is significant, right? Um, this covers both objective number four, which is describe the structure and function of a capillary bed and types of capillaries, and objective number 11, which is describe factors that are involved in capillary dynamics and explain why each is important or significant, right? So capillaries are very, very small. They're very, very thin, but they all, the three types of capillaries have different jobs that they have to do, and they allow different things to pass through them based upon their job. Notice how this is very, very thin. You have a single basement membrane around it, and then you have the actual cells of the capillary, but everything is so tiny and small that it's only allowing one red blood cell through at a time. This is one your erythrocyte, right? Your capillaries are super, super tiny and thin. I wasn't lying when I said that, like, at the beginning of this, right? A capillary bed is typically the name for a bunch of capillaries that are intertwined, right? It is called a thoroughfare channel right, or a precapillary sphincter, they provide local control for the blood and distribution around a specific area where the bed or it looks like a net when you draw them is spanned, right? They're going to uh, provide vasomotion for blood flow, 
And their job is to be have a wide enough net distributed so that there's only a few cells between each capillaries so that they can distribute nutrients to cells like three layers deep from the capillary, but not much more than that. You have a ton of capillaries in your body, right? So that's the purpose of a capillary bed. And you have three types of capillaries, right? This first type of capillary here is a continuous capillary. Continuous capillaries are the most common capillaries in your entire body. They have tight, like, tight junctions with each other. They're close. Um, and they have decent intercellular clefts between one another, right? Um, so these are the type of capillaries that make up the blood-brain barrier, right? Um, they're going to transport some vesicles. They have a complete endothelium. Most vascular tissue would be these capillaries. They are continuous capillaries, right? The second type of capillaries you have are called fenestrated capillaries. Fenestrated is another fancy term for perfusion or microcirculation. Fenestrated capillaries have tiny itty bitty holes in the cell in the cells that make the capillary. Capillaries are one, like if you didn't get it from looking at this picture, capillaries do have a protective basement membrane and then they are one cell layer thick because their job is to get nutrients from the blood and blood cells in here, out there. The fewer layers of cells you have before you're feeding these cells that would be out here, the better. So capillaries are one cell layer thick, right? Fenestrated capillaries have pores in their cell walls and cell layers that are around them. And the reason for that is so they can have more, they're more permeable to fluids and things crossing in and out of the capillary, right? That means they are more permeable to fluids flowing in or out based upon where the capillary is located. And more solutes can flow in or out of them. Right? So some examples of places that have a decent amount of fenestrated capillaries. The capillaries that are covering your small intestines are fenestrated because those capillaries not only need to feed the small intestines because your small intestines have a job to do and you need to nourish them, but the small intestines, in addition to giving them the small intestine cells waste, these capillaries are also sort of the place where the small intestines are dumping the nutrients that they absorb from the food you eat. That's how those vitamins and minerals and that sugar that you just ate get into your blood, right? So all of the nutrients that you just ate, as well as the waste byproducts from your actual intestinal cells, have to come into these capillaries that are around your small intestines. So they have these little pores here, these fenestrated capillaries, so that the nutrients can come in, right? Uh, same deal with your kidneys, right? Because your kidneys are also filters for your body, and you, your kidneys have to make sure that the waste that will create your urine gets out. So when blood is pumping through these vessels in your kidneys, not only are they trading the nutrients like the rest of the capillaries and whatnot should, but they're also letting other waste byproducts out that need to come out of your blood. That way your kidneys can filter it and get rid of it. Right? Um, so these are also located in your eye. Right? So these are the kind of capillaries that are located in your eyeball. Um, as well as all the glands in your body. Because the glands in your body not only need the nutrient exchange from blood, but remember they're also dropping off and doing their job creating a chemical hormone and then needing to drop off that chemical hormone in your bloodstream. These little pores allow them to just drop it into your bloodstream straight from the gland, right? That's the job of your fenestrated capillaries. The third type of capillary, right? Um, these are the ones that are the least common 
They are called sinusoidal capillaries, and that's because the pores in them are the biggest pores out of any capillary, right? These are the most permeable, meaning that these capillaries allow the most stuff in and out of them. And they are found only in very specific, specialized locations of your body that would need holes in the capillaries to exchange larger molecules that readily and easily, right? So they have an incomplete lining as well as major large gaps. So these kind of things can be found in your liver, your spleen, and your bone marrow. Because remember, your liver and spleen are not only doing the regular blood nutrients and waste trade, but they are also removing dead red blood cells from your blood so that they can recycle the parts, right? And your bone marrow is also creating new red blood cells or new blood cells, period, to drop off back into your bloodstream. This is how they do that, through these large gaps in the capillary walls. That's why your sinusoidal capillaries are the least common and only found in very specific locations in your body, but they are the most permeable. Right? And that brings us to... Well, I've already explained capillary beds to y'all. This is kind of what they look like when you start drawing them like nets. And that brings us to veins, which is what capillaries flow into, right? It's the next thing on the list. And objective number five, discuss the structure and function of veins, compare and contrast them with arteries, right? So veins, right, they have valves. Because... Like, they have valves, they have a larger lumen, or tunica interna, than arteries do. Um, but they don't need the muscles that helped constrict or dilate as much, so veins have a thinner tunica media. They are missing or have very little elastic tissue. Um, your blood pressure in your veins, honestly, is going to be around 40, around 40 millimeters Hg. Right, um, your veins are going to function as blood reservoirs. So at any given point in time, up to 70% in, of the blood in your body is in your veins, like at, in, at any time. Um, veins are high compliance. That means they can take a lot of blood and hold on to it. Um, this blood is basically just like your veins are easygoing. Um... They hold on to most of the blood in your body. Your muscles, when they can, like any muscle, like your calf muscles, for example, when they contract, they kind of milk the blood back up the veins from your feet back up. Um, so that's how this blood stays in circulation and doesn't stay still for long. But a lot of blood is held in your veins at any given point in time, right? If we're comparing that to your arteries, um, your arteries did have larger tunica medias. They did not have valves. Only veins have valves. And the blood pressure in your artery is going to be anywhere from 100 to 40 millimeters Hg, or millimeters mercury. And capillaries only have the tunica inter interna. That's it. Right? So there you go. You can see these are arteries... Th they have thicker walls and are more defined. This vein is more squished here. His veins care, can carry more blood and they are more relaxed, how shall I say, than an artery is. Right? They have lower blood pressure. They kind of use your other muscles in the body to help milk the blood up. Right? So skeletal muscles help the venous return is your fancy way of saying that. Um... So one thing we're going to talk about with veins, even though we're going to talk more about disorders and whatnot in your next video, since this was just about uh, definitions and whatnot, sometimes your veins, if you don't exercise enough or if you overwork some of your veins, like if you're on your feet for 12-hour shifts six days a week, um, the valves that snap the veins shut and the milking processes that keep the blood just going back, like, 
going upwards, sometimes you can warp your veins if you treat them poorly and they will end up warping like this and then the valves can't close completely. That can be bad for your blood flow. The name, the fancy name that we have given this is called varicose veins. You can go to the doctor and have this treated. Sometimes the doctor will recommend that you need this treated because of circulation problems. Most of the time when you hear about varicose veins being spoken about, it's in terms of a um, cosmetic issue because some women do not like the fact that their legs may someday look like this depending upon their jobs. Um, but varicose veins can be painful. This kind of thing can impact your life negatively as well as like veins distended and twisted is going to affect your blood flow and its circulation and that kind of thing. So depend, depending upon all of these factors will determine what the doctor recommends you do. Some people just want to have this kind of thing treated for aesthetic purposes because it doesn't bother them otherwise. Others actually need this treated for circulation problems. Um, but either way, varicose veins will get worse over time if not treated. Um, but yeah, there you go. Now you guys have your basic definitions and whatnot. We'll get into nitty gritty stuff in your next video. I hope you have a wonderful day.